Okay, thank you for that momentous introduction. Um, I'll, I'll start by just thanking the organizers for the invitation to come speak to you here at this uh, amazingly large gathering. I think this is certainly the largest audience in one place that I've ever addressed. So as I put it in my title, I like to take the long view, at least about certain, certain matters. So let me, taking the long view, start at the beginning of a slightly long story. I, not that long, you'll, you'll be okay. The, um, the beginning of the story was 1989. The setting of the story is, was Bellcor, Bell Communications Research, then the brand new Bell Labs of the local phone companies in the US. I was a young researcher in cryptography, which I like to call the science and engineering of protecting information. I stole that definition, by the way, from the great cryptographer Ron, Ron Rivest, the R of RSA for those uh, uh, those who know a bit of cryptography. Protecting information means keeping it secret, if it should be secret, and making sure it hasn't changed, if it shouldn't change. And of course, that last piece is at the center of the story I'm telling. So that fall of 1989, I'd been at Belcour a couple of years, but a, a new guy, a, a new hire arrived at the lab, and very soon after he arrived, he knocked on my door. His name was Scott Stronetta, still is Scott Stronetta, and he came to me with a problem that he thought we might uh, work on together. He wasn't sure how to solve it, but he had the idea that there might be some, some cryptography um, involved. And I was the youngest cryptographer there, so he, so he hit it off. The problem that was bothering him was this one. How to ensure the integrity of digital records. It certainly hadn't happened yet, but already in 1990, uh, 1989, it was clear that all the world's records were going online. Computer files are, of course, easy to change. And we were worried about their integrity. In fact, taking the long view already back then, we were worried about the long-term integrity of all the world's records, all of them, once they'd gone online. Now, a story in the news at that time, at least the scientific news, was this one about the Nobel uh, biology winner, David Baltimore, and his younger co-author, on a particular paper, Teresa Imanishikari. She was accused of having changed her experimental data, data that she'd kept in a lab notebook, paper lab notebook. As it turned out, she was later completely exonerated, but it was a pointed example for Scott and me of the difference between physical records with forensic properties and digital records. So the two of us set out to tackle the problem, which we phrased as how to timestamp a digital document. Of course, digital document, digital file, digital record, those are all the same thing. But uh, why timestamp? Why that choice of words? Because the problem was posed, is posed, completely inside the world of algorithms, where records are simply numbers, strings of bits. You can't take a string of bits and stamp it like you can with, with a piece of paper. So if you think about it at all, the structure of any solution to the problem, integrity checking problem, has to have three pieces. First, a procedure to register the record. Next, the result of that procedure, which can only be another bit string, 
a registration receipt, perhaps, what we called the timestamp certificate for, for, for the record in question. Finally, all that would be useless without the third piece, a, a verification procedure, which checks that a record and its putative timestamp certificate are correct. The verification, of course, should work like this. Genuine record certificate pairs should verify easily as correct, and fake ones, forgery should be impossible or computationally infeasible. So, we uh, came up with a solution, and that was our title, How to Timestamp a Digital Document. We presented it at a meeting, the Crypto Conference, as it was called, still is called, um, of 1990. This was back when crypto meant cryptography, not cryptocurrency. Crypto was then, the crypto meeting was then, still is, the um, premier technical conference in the field. Available cryptographic techniques at the time pointed to a straightforward solution, one that used a single central trusted entity, at least within a particular community or, or domain. For the experts in the room here, that was what we called the hash and sign solution. But this solution was unsatisfactory to us. A single central entity is what security people call a single point of failure, one that can be bribed, corrupted, hacked. Could we do better? Well, we tried, and for some while we banged our heads against the wall, and we could not do better. Maybe, maybe we thought after a while it was because the task that we'd set ourselves was actually impossible. So, next step, we spent some time trying to prove that, that statement. And then, lo and behold, in the course of trying to work out a mathematical proof that the task we'd set ourselves was impossible, we suddenly realized it was possible. I'll show you how it works. The, um, here begins a four to five minute animation describing our solution, explaining the basics of blockchain. Now, everybody in this room actually knows this already, so why am I bothering with, th with this? I myself, like most of you here, have wrestled with the problem of how to explain blockchain stuff to friends and family who are outside our world of blockchain enthusiasm. Here's my way of doing it. I'll begin with um, one technical tool, which I'll explain with a metaphor. So the technical tool is called one-way hash functions, cryptographic hash functions, and the metaphor is fingerprinting. A one-way hash function is a standard way to process a file to, as it were, take its fingerprint. Now that's a good metaphor. The fingerprint of a file or record is short, no matter the size of the file. The fingerprint gives no information about the file, just like my own fingerprint gives you no information about me. The fingerprint is characteristic of the file. If you take the fingerprint of several identical copies of the same file, you get that many copies of exactly the same fingerprint. And finally, most important of all of this short list of magical properties of one-way hash functions, the fingerprint is unique to the file. Two different files, even if they only differ in a single bit position, they will have wildly different fingerprints. Okay, now I'll show you how Scott and I used this fingerprinting process to build a blockchain. Of course, we didn't use that word, but we built a blockchain in order to solve our timestamping problem. In fact, Belcor actually spun off a new enterprise, a startup, to commercialize our solution. That startup was called Surety, S-U-R-E-T-Y. And here's how it worked. 
our customers would send us timestamp requests, registration requests, as it were. Um, we actually had some customers, nowhere near as many as we wanted, but we had some. So requests would come in, and we'd, um, we'd group them into batches. Of course, here I'll call them blocks. So we, we would take the, um, take the first block of requests, and as it were, take the fingerprint of the entire, of that short list of, of, of requests. That is, we would compute a fingerprint, a summarizing fingerprint, in such a way that every individual request in the block could be efficiently and unforgeably linked to the summarizing fingerprint for the whole block. For those in the know, of course, we, we built a Merkle tree. Thank you, Ralph Merkle. OK, we had a few customers. Another bunch of requests would come in, and we would do the same thing. We would take the second block's fingerprint, but we would link that one to the, to the fingerprint of the first block, again, using the fingerprinting process. A third block would come in, a fourth, and so on. And pretty soon, we have a, a chain of blocks. As the chain continued, we would take a length of, of the, uh, a recent length of the chain, for example, once a week, and take its fingerprint. That is, we would compute a single fingerprint that summarizes the entire week of of records, and because of the chaining, summarize the entire history of the chain up to the computation of that, of, of that fingerprint. Now, take a step back and remember this was in the early 90s. The World Wide Web didn't exist yet. Some of us already lived in the world of email, but the um, World Wide Web didn't exist. Scott and I had the problem of enabling the world in current blockchain world lingo, enabling the world to reach consensus on the exact values of the fingerprints in our system. How do we do that? Beginning in 1991, well, you've already heard in the, um, in the introduction, if you didn't know it before, here's what we did. Oh, it, what, here's what we did in order to make the appearance of each week's summary fingerprint a widely witnessed event a widely witnessable and a widely verifiable event. We placed each week's summarizing fingerprint in a small advertisement in the national edition of the Sunday New York Times every week. And that chain is still running. Here's a, here's a photo of me that was tweeted out. Um, I'm standing at the 2018 incarnation of that same annual uh, crypto conference um, meeting. This was, this was one of the more recent ones before the pandemic. And I'm holding a copy of the most recent Sunday New York Times. There at the bottom of the page is a small advertisement containing a number, a fingerprint, the summarizing fingerprint of that week. And here in my hands is the New York Times that was delivered to my apartment in New York on Sunday, October 23rd, a uh, week and a half ago, 10 days ago. Um, I don't have the most recent uh, New York Times because uh, on Sunday I was in the air from New York to, 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 to Singapore. And here inside is that week's ad which contains a number, a fingerprint, every bit of which depends on every bit of every request that has come in to surety servers since, since we began running the code, first as experimental code at Belcor in 91, and then in 95 as a, um, um, as a commercial, commercial uh, offering. We published our first such ad, not in 95, but in, um, sorry, 
for correcting you there. The, uh, but in fact, in October 1991, the genesis block of the surety blockchain. Okay, take a step back, enough, enough about me. Uh, here, um, the story jumps some 15 years um, in the future. We have just this week, in fact, celebrated the 14-year anniversary of the appearance of Bitcoin with the publication on a cryptographer's mailing list of, of this paper. Now, I don't know about the title Satoshi's Inspiration, for this um, session, but just to get it out of the way, I'll say, I'll repeat, as I've repeated many times, that, that um, Scott and I are not Satoshi. Not separately and not together. We, we, we haven't been hiding in plain sight all these years. In any case, Satoshi, whoever he is, she is, they were, Satoshi needed a way to ensure the integrity of the digital records that were the, that constituted the financial transactions in the Bitcoin system. In order to do that, Satoshi chose exactly the blockchain algorithm, the blockchain data structure that I just animated for you. Satoshi chose that as the, as Bitcoin's integrity mechanism. I'm sure many of you here have read Satoshi's paper, but for those few of you in the room who haven't, I'm flipping here to the last page, and those are the three references that, um, uh, that were uh, alluded to in the introduction to my talk. Scott and I are very grateful to Satoshi for having given us such good academic references in the paper, but I should add, that Satoshi's references were by no means complete. For example, there's no mention in the paper of the existing work on consensus protocols, work that went all the way back to early work in the 70s by Leslie Lamport, Turing Award winner, who more or less invented the field of distributed systems. So, a few things have happened since the Bitcoin code was launched in early 2009. And I'll, say, I'll finish by saying a few words about um, a couple of these things. I'll begin with NFTs. What's an NFT? Uh, besides being a, a, a badly chosen uh, name for something. But what's an NFT? Essentially, an NFT is just a time-stamped assertion of ownership. Nothing more and sometimes less. That's it. What can you do with it? Hold it, sell it, trade it. Um, context is all. Human, social, legal context, market forces, and so on. In fact, you can say something pretty similar about DAOs, DAOs, Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. Once again, context is all. Human, social, legal, in my non-expert opinion, to think that the world of politics and business is going to be totally, completely revolutionized because code is law, that's, um, that's just plain silly. No sense of history. Autonomous, entirely independent of politics and regulation? I don't think so. Next, a few words about smart contracts. Smart contracts, like all programs, are hard to write well and safely. And we've all seen many examples of vulnerabilities. Some of them pretty expensive. Uh, vulnerabilities in, 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 in uh, blockchain systems that use smart contracts. I did just say the word DAO, right? There's still a lot of hard work to be done in the area of tools and mechanisms for buttressing the security of smart contracts. Stepping back to take the long view again, here's a New York Times story that appeared while I was in the air from New York City to Singapore just this past weekend. 
I dare say that secure digital time stepping, um, blockchain techniques, are likely to be at least a part of this, uh, the solution to science's, um, all of science's pressing problem. I'd like to finish by saying that since Bitcoin began to take off and people be began to use the word blockchain to describe its underlying integrity mechanism, I've been watching the explosion of work in this domain with awe and wonder, and I'm eagerly looking forward to seeing what the future brings, likely coming from many of you. Thank you. Thank you.